Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Welcome you back to the next uh, to the course on inorganic chemistry of life. Uh, in the previous class, we have looked at uh, uh, aspects related to spectral uh, methods such as uh, uh, method on mass spectrometry, method on fluorescent spectroscopy, and we have been looking at the NMR spectroscopy. Uh, I said I will show some examples to study both the dynamics of this as well as the paramagnetic relaxation uh, things too. Yes, so what we looked at in the previous case was that uh, the spectrum when you have a diamagnetic that means no paramagnetic species uh, that will come uh, the proton and mass spectrum will come in 0 to 10, 0 to 15 ppm. Once you have a paramagnetic center in that they will shift to any extent depending upon the contact shift. So, these are referred as the contact shifts. Uh, one example shown on the left side is that a cobalt 3 plus which is a D6 system uh, and uh, this D6 system having uh, all electrons being paired becomes diamagnetic and it comes as if like if you take uh, just a phenanthaline uh, moiety uh, NMR or you take its cobalt 3 complex it will be alike. On the other hand instead of the cobalt 3 plus you take uh, uh, just cobalt 2 plus all that you have is just one electron difference. So, one electron now it is a D7 system and the D7 system resulting in a paramagnetic center uh, the cobalt center cobalt 2 plus center. So, the coordination is the same kind of thing, but that will shift the proton resonances to even 100 ppm. So, going from very small region of this within 10 ppm to about 100, 110 ppm as you can see all of these. This kind of thing is a boon in disguise because the paramagnetic contact will shift these ones to a greater extent. Okay, on the right side same thing as shown the example, example of the hexanol and hexanol has got all these CH2 groups, the 5 CH2 groups, 1 CH3 and 1 OH. The OH is seen, the CH3 is seen, but all the CH2s have come within this small region. But now, if you add some paramagnetic uh, reagent like uh, some kind of an europium, uh, europium species, that europium species will, uh, will bind to this and to different extents at the of course, the at the uh, uh, alcohol position and that will bring a contact shift on the methylene, first methylene, second methylene, third methylene etcetera. The maximum will be in the first methylene, less will be in the second methylene, third methylene etcetera etcetera you can see. And this kind of a contact shift will resolve all the CH2 groups that are buried under this particular envelope to this kind of thing. So, it is is it not a great boon to have a paramagnetism while the organic chemists think the paramagnetic uh, they call it as an impurity. And for an inorganic chemist, bioinorganic chemist, biological inorganic chemist that impurity what they think is actually a boon in this. So, in metalloproteins and metalloenzymes you have a lot of transition metal ion centers. Many of those transition metal ions could be paramagnetic and then they, when they bind to the protein one can study the their shifts too. It is not only that you can also study some kind of a dynamics. So, dynamics is very important. Okay? So, the dynamics is very important because uh, the, uh, the proteins have always uh, have uh, various variations in their conformation and dynamics when the substrate binds, when the substrate is converted to product and the product is released. All of these steps the protein does not sit idle or sit stationary there will be a kind of changes. So, such changes can also be followed. So, as a small example is shown over there where uh, this particular ligand which is binding through these nitrogens can shift to the other nitrogen this particular nitrogen is here. So, on the right side you have that particular. So, this is a kind of a uh, binding uh, changes, changes in that. So, this kind of a species moving into this kind of a species. So, these are in dynamic equilibrium and this dynamic equilibrium is controlled by the temperature. Okay? The lowering the temperature 
the dynamic control will be more controlled, not so much of change. And if you allow it uh, to a, a room temperature or a higher temperature, then this exchange will be very fast. You can also call this as an exchange between one kind of species to another kind of species. The species present on the left side to that species present on the right side. What is the difference? The difference is bound uh, centers to the metal that itself is bound. Now, you can see there is a host of spectra here at uh, minus 40, minus 30, minus 20, minus 10, 0, etcetera. So, that means you are going from down to up, you are increasing the temperature from minus 30 to almost room temperature, a little greater than the room temperature. Okay. So, therefore, here you have uh, a more or less uh, the arrested kind of a things, these exchange less, less and exchange is, uh, is, is exchange arrest is less. So, that means freedom is more, much more freedom, much more freedom, then they will be exchanging very fast. So, exchanging slow to exchanging fast. So, from these you can, uh, these uh, the peaks which are several here and they become closer and they become broader and they merge and that is what is called the coalescence behavior. So, from this coalescence behavior of these proton shifts, you can measure the, uh, uh, the barrier that is present and going from the species on the left side to the species on the right side. So, there is always an energy barrier that is present. This energy barrier uh, can be cross over by increasing the temperature. So, lower the temperature, the species can be seen separately. They increase the temperature, the species interconversion is fast and you cannot resolve that. So, that means dynamics of the protein can be very well studied by NMR spectroscopy. In the previous slide, we have talked about the paramagnetism, contact shifts. So, therefore, you can study. In here, you have dynamics. So, the paramagnetism not only shifts the contacts, also paramagnetic relaxation times will also. And you know the NMR spectra uh, governed by two types of uh, uh, relaxations. Okay. So, uh, NMR relaxation okay. uh, longitudinal and transverse. So, I will not go into details of these, uh, it is called T1, it is called T2. So, these are again uh, influenced by the protein conformation and the dynamics too. Okay. And uh, the other thing is that uh, they influence different centers of the, if it is a proton spectrum, different centers of the proton based on their distance. Okay. So, these, uh, these relaxation times the T is proportional to 1 by r to the power of 6. So, r is the uh, distance uh, between the paramagnetic center and uh, the proton that you are looking at. that is being studied. Okay. So, that is being studied. Okay. So, therefore, this phenomena can also be uh, explored and exploited and that is what is example is shown here. This uh, uh, framework is a protein framework and there is a manganese ion and this manganese ion is bound to protein on one side on the other side is it is bound to this particular phosphate moiety having this carbon skeleton. And you see this is the paramagnetic center and if you see this proton is by this much distance and this proton is by this much distance and this proton is by this much distance and this proton is by this much distance. So, by measuring the relaxation times you can get the distance. As I told you, the relaxation times and the distances are related by the T is, uh, is equal to, uh, T is proportional to 1 by r power 6. So, this you can measure experimentally and this you can uh, uh, obtain. 
Okay? So, therefore, in the if you, you measure the relaxation time, so this protein in presence of this manganese and this one, then you can get how this is oriented. Okay? From the distances you can uh, fit, fit into your model and that minimize the model and that model will give you uh, the uh, where it is binding, how it is binding with respect to protein. Similarly, you can also study some protons of the protein too uh, in terms of their relaxation times. So, therefore, the relaxation times will give you distance and that will fix the protein conformation. So, you can study the protein conformation also indirectly here by using the relaxation measurements the of this uh, that particular proton under the influence of the paramagnetic ion. So, paramagnetic ion proton, this proton is under the, uh, the observation. So, one proton is shown over there, one proton is shown over there, another proton is shown over there, another proton is shown over there. You can get their distances. Using these distances, you can uniquely build the whole structure. So, that means using the paramagnetic NMR, contact shifted NMR, paramagnetic relaxations, dynamic NMR you can study almost all kinds of phenomena between the protein and the substrate binding. The protein, uh, the, when the substrate is converted to the uh, product, all these kinds of dynamics that is happening can be studied uh, in that too. Now, let us slightly switch the gears to another technique. So, right now what we have seen? Nuclear magnetic resonance, where the nuclear spin is changed. Now, instead instead of the nucleus, suppose you take electron. So, electron is also having the uh, spin of the positive spin of the negative. Just like the nuclear spin plus half minus half, you also have electron having a plus half and minus half. So, therefore, we can also look at the, uh, uh, the, the resonance uh, by the or transition by the electron spin going from one type of spin to the other is not only in proton. Okay, so, uh, so, in case of the electron, you can see that the in the absence of any magnetic field, uh, you have the same energy and when you apply the magnetic field, these do uh, break up. Okay. And now, the <coughs> energy gap between this uh, state and this particular state of the spin is quite large. Uh, as compared to that, the uh, quite, quite different as compared to that of the proton, because in the proton case, there is a mass involved, the electron case, the mass is not involved or mass is very small. As you know, the mass is almost 1800 to 2000 smaller in case of electron as compared to the proton. So, therefore, since the mass term comes into picture, this break will be different. So, therefore, these are found. Uh, these transitions are found not in the uh, megahertz region, but they are found in the gigahertz region. So, therefore, in NMR, in the NMR spectra found in uh, megahertz, this is mega and in uh, EPR, these are found in gigahertz. Uh, okay, so this is uh, giga gigahertz. So gigahertz, megahertz. So therefore, that energy difference is definitely there, and this can further couple with the nuclear spin if you have, and this in this particular case three over two nuclear spin and further get splitted, and both the uh, the lower an electronic state, higher electronic state both get. Now, you can see the transitions going from these ones. Okay? I am not talking about the all the transition rules etcetera, etcetera. So, uh, so because that will become too much more into the, the physical chemistry aspects, but just appreciate that these four transitions are possible. And these four transitions are shown over there here, 1, 2, 3, 4. So, obviously, their gap difference is different means which means energy is different that means they come at a different values. So, instead of measuring in the uh, frequency mode, you measure in the, uh, the, uh, the field strength uh, 
uh, in Gauss. So, one would basically measure in the Gauss. So, therefore, the x axis in this is not the frequency like in the NMR which is converted into the ppm. Here it is the Gauss. So, you keep changing slowly the magnetization or magnetic field strength and the different transitions can be understood. Okay. The nuclear uh, splitting under the influence of field and then, then the nuclear uh, sorry electrons the two spins of the electrons are split in, in the magnetic field. Uh, and then sub farther apart and each of these nuclear spin uh, the electron spin is further coupled with the nuclear spin and further split. So, therefore, you get. So, this kind of thing uh, is the splitting is a hyperfine and this kind of a connectivity is called super hyperfine. Okay. So, that means you can find both the nuclear spin connectivity as well as the electron spin things too. Okay. So, therefore, the number of lines will depend upon 2 n i plus 1, the i is the spin of the nuclei and is the number of such nuclei. Okay. So, therefore, how many of such nuclei? Let us take one example to understand this, you have a vanadyl acetyl acetone. So, V double bond O, this is called vanadyl and acetyl acetonate, there is one acetyl acetonate, another acetyl acetonate, each of the acetyl acetonate is 1 minus, the two of them are 2 minus, oxo is 2 minus, totally 4 minus and vanadium is 4 plus and therefore, it is a neutral. So, this is the bis acetyl acetonate 2 vanadyl actually and the vanadium has got a nuclear spin of 7 over 2 and if and how many vanadiums are there? Only one. So, that means, if you apply in this particular formula to n i plus 1, 2 into 1 into 7 by 2 plus 1. So, if you take the case of this one in the 2 n i plus 1 <coughs> in the vanadyl acetyl aspirinate complex uh, for the i for vanadium is 7 over 2. So, if you take 2 n i plus 1 2 n i plus 1 so, n is uh, number of uh, vanadiums in this, in this it is uh, 1 and i is nuclear spin of vanadium and that is 7 over 2. So, therefore, that is equal to 2 into 1 into 7 over 2 uh, plus 1 that will be 8 lines. So, you should get 8 line spectrum uh, in this and you can see that the 8 line spectrum is shown over there 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 8 line spectrum. So, this means this is a nuclear hyperfine uh, coupling is being seen in this example. Okay. So, uh, that will. now let us continue with the EPR aspects of it. Now, in the EPR aspects of it. Uh, then let, let us look at uh, uh, an inorganic complex which is a copper complex of a uh, peptide. Okay. So, let us look at uh, this copper complex of uh, the uh, peptides. So, in this we have a 9 peptide, 11 amino acid peptide, a 12 amino acid peptide. And these are the EPR spectra measured. EXP refers to experimental, SIML refers to the simulated. You can experimentally measure, you can also simulate using the parameters. Then all that you see that the 11 and 12 and whereas 9. So, there is some little hyperfine uh, kind of a couplings that you see different, but otherwise very similar kind of things. Okay. And this can be understood uh, from see these are the this is the sequence what is binding in this is the 9 a cysteine a histidine and a methionine in case of 11 a cysteine a histidine uh, another cysteine and a histidine and in the 12 a cysteine a cysteine a histidine and a methionine okay so you have all of these are bound to the copper center of course copper uh, in all these things is copper 2 plus uh, no point in uh, looking at copper 1 plus you know why why copper 1 plus cannot be studied? Copper 1 plus is a D 10 system, copper 2 plus is a D 9 system. So, D 9 system will have an unpaired electron, D 10 system will not have an unpaired electron, therefore, a copper 1 cannot be studied at all. Okay? So, that is the kind of uh, uh, 
uh, thing. In fact, in some uh, enzymes where copper 2 plus is there, you look at the, uh, the EPR spectrum which is coming from the copper 2 plus very nice. Then you add some reducing agent and the copper 2 plus becomes copper 1 plus and then it turns into from uh, D 9 system to D 10 system and becomes uh, EPR inactive. So, EPR active to EPR inactive too. In this case, all of these are EPR active and that is because copper 2. Now, this is being analyzed better in this particular in the next slide and this is this slide. So, there are three copper complexes as you can see and from the EPR spectra you can get uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the shift that is found which is uh, uh, found in the form of the Gauss as a, uh, as a position. Okay, you can get that kind of thing is also referred as a G value in many cases. So, the G value is plotted in terms of the Gauss and the, the coupling ones. Let us just uh, for a while let us look at these ones and the distance between these ones is the, uh, is the uh, coupling values. So, as you can see from here to here, here to here, here to here, similarly here. So, these are the uh, uh, coupling values which is referred as the A values. So, the A is a uh, uh, hyperfine coupling and this is the uh, position of the peak the G. So, the G to G correlation you see so nicely connected by a straight line. So, this is all not important you do not go through all these things all that you need to look at is this particular thing. So, therefore, the positioning the, uh, the EPR peak position versus the, the connectivity between these uh, thing in terms of the hyperfine coupling values are uh, uh, correlatable from one to the other and that is what we can make in this. And as I told you that you can also study not only copper many other paramagnetic things like manganese can be studied and iron can be studied, some molybdenum can be studied, some of them in their uh, oxidation states where they show the paramagnetism for all of them one can study. And uh, of course, the interpretation of the EPR is somewhat dif difficult compared to the other spectroscopy that I have talked to you uh, uh, earlier. Okay. So, let us look at another uh, technique, uh, another technique is, uh, uh, is the electrochemistry. So, the electrochemistry uh, this we are talking about the cyclic voltammetry. So, electrochemistry uh, is basically you add an electron to the system a molecule, you remove an electron to the system or a molecule, what happens to it? How do one measure in terms of what happens? So, this is what is basically studied. So, one of the ways is that you apply a potential or vary the potential and measure the current. So, if you take uh, apply a potential, vary the potential and measure the current, therefore, the current versus the uh, versus the voltage is called the volta metry current versus the voltage is called the voltammetry. Uh, sorry, voltage versus the current is the voltammetry, voltage versus current. So, you apply voltage voltage versus current is uh, voltammetry. Of course, what, so what you do in this? you apply keep applying the potential and measure the uh, measure the current. So, in this case why it became cyclic? Just follow me as, as I take this cursor. Let us say I took a solution containing a compound which is electroactive. I start from this particular uh, voltage and I keep increasing the voltage towards this direction. So, it goes along with this okay? and there is a uh, sudden increase in the in the uh, 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 in the current of this, and at this stage, I reverse the potential. So if I reverse the potential, it doesn't go through the same. It comes from the another. So it comes through this. So it comes through the whole thing, and then goes back. So I start from V1, go to V2, and reverse the switch the direction of the potential, and then come back. Potential has a sign a positive potential, negative potential. So, going from this to this increasing means going towards the positive direction and going from here to here is you are going from this potential and decreasing it is a negative side. 
So, you have a positive sign, you have a negative sign. Okay. So, so you can reduce, you can reoxidize kind of a species and that is all. So, it becomes a cyclic. So, therefore, it is a cyclic voltammetry going from left to the right and then reversing the potential and coming back. And this is where you can make uh, the whole difference in this particular uh, methodology you can make. For example, you take a electrode, here it is shown example, a silver, silver electrode and take a solution of the protein, a metalloprotein. And a metalloprotein containing uh, the, uh, the uh, ion center, ion metalloprotein, ion with the 2 plus uh, and going to ion 3 plus. So, that is what oxidation. And this one, the, the Br going to Br minus is what reduction. So, this oxidation of this is connected with this reduction and this reduction is connected with the electrode. So, from electrode you go from uh, this uh, uh, Br minus to Br, Br minus to Br is oxidation and this oxidation will, uh, will give away the electron and this electron will be picked by the bro Br and this way or it will be picked up by uh, uh, this to return back and in the process it will activate the metalloprotein ion 2 plus to ion 3 plus. So, therefore, it is coupled with this. So, everything is coupled to the electrode. Okay? So, at the electrode uh, you are releasing the electron and this electron is being taken up by this and as a result of this process is coupled with this and going from ion 2 plus to ion 3 plus oxidation. So, you, similarly you can do reduction as well. So, you can do oxidation of the protein, you can do reduction of the protein, everything is possible uh, by changing the potential here. So, and you know that in case of the metalloproteins and metalloenzymes, bone in disguise you have metal ions, metal ions having different oxidation states, therefore you can take the protein from one to the other. And the protein also has a, a conformation, therefore the potential is also affected by the conformation of the protein as well. So, the medium, the protein conformation and the redox going between the positive to the negative all of these kind of things. Okay, let us take one example here. So, uh, this is an electrode, the electrode is modified and the modified by this kind of thing and this particular thing is connected with the protein. So, this whole background kind of a, a thing, spiral etc., is a protein. In that protein, there are centers well, one, there is another two, three, three, four, etc. And these are all electron transfer centers and primarily these are all iron sulfur centers. And then here you have uh, actual reaction center where the reaction occurs from H2 going to 2H plus, H2 to going to 2H plus, plus 2 electrons is what? Oxidation. So, H2 going to 2H plus, plus electron to uh, H2 going to 2 H plus plus 2 electrons. Okay? So, this is an oxidation process. This oxidation process is you can be identified, you can be studied and the electron is transferred from where? From the electrode through this to this, from there to here, from there to here, from there to here. At the end the reaction site is this one. So, it is at this side the hydrogen goes to o proton and uh, but to get there you need this uh, process. So, this entire process is controlled by uh, the uh, ion sulfur proteins having different uh, redox potentials. So, having different redox potentials is a bone in disguise. That is why nature has, has uh, identified its own or managed uh, its proteins to have uh, centers of ion sulfur with different potentials. I will explain this more details when I come to the ion sulfur proteins uh, story in this. A simple example is shown over there. A simple example is that an electrode modified with this uh, uh, moiety which is connected to this particular um, amide. So, this amide having the, the phosphorus centers bound to the nickel center and another uh, ligand. So, this whole thing you can do a redox and this particular molecule can convert uh, H plus to H2 and then H2 to H plus. So, they can do both reversibly in this. So, H2 getting in H plus 2. So, redox kind of thing. So, therefore, one can 
basically look at all these things look at uh, different kinds of redox systems here you have as you go from top to the bottom you are having the reduction potentials are becoming less negative or rather more positive that means more reduction is favorable. How do you understand this? You can understand this by delta G is minus n f e or e naught. So, if the potential is minus this minus into minus is plus if the potential is plus plus into minus is minus. So, more reduction potential positive means this will be minus more feasible. So, n is number of electrons uh, involved uh, in the reaction and this is Faraday constant. So, the more positive potential will make delta G more negative that means reduction uh, potential more positive means that reduction is more favored. So, as you go from this to this more and more reduction is favored. If you go in the reverse direction more and more oxidation is favored in this. Let us see this in the context of uh, an example of uh, uh, a copper proteins. You can see here these are all small molecules up to here and if you go down here this is a lacase, this is an enzyme copper, ceruloplasmid is an enzyme, azurin is an enzyme, plastocyanin is an enzyme. So, why are we studying all this? We are studying all this to find out what kind of a centers are present in the proteins. So, therefore, we are taking a small molecular uh, copper complexes here, this copper complex between 2 plus 1 plus potential is plus 0.59. The next complex with the chloro is plus 0 0.40. Similarly, you go to imidazole kind of thing plus 0.26, you go to the pyridine plus 0.197. So, your potential is smoothly changing from plus 0.6 to over this. And if you look at uh, the, uh, so what is happening? As you go down further and further, the nitrogen kind of a bindings are reducing, oxygen bindings are increasing. You go to the copper alanine, you have mainly the lot of carboxylate oxygens are being bound. Therefore, the potential is being basically converted from positive to the negative. So, therefore, redox potentials are dependent on what is directly bound to the metal center. They are also important uh, or they are also uh, dependent on the protein conformation as well. All those parameters will affect. Okay. So, going from uh, nitrogens to the oxygens to the minus containing oxygen carboxylates etcetera the potential is. Now, you look at the peptide uh, the proteins the lacase plus 0.4, ceruloplasmin plus 0.39. So, these are all roughly very similar. What it means basically in these proteins you have a lot of nitrogen or imidazole binding is involved in all of these. Therefore, their redox potentials are very similar to those of these uh, these particular derivatives. Okay. So, uh, so what we have uh, seen, we have uh, uh, continued with the NMR in this lecture, then we have continued with uh, uh, the EPR which is an extension, then we have looked at the electrochemistry and we started with the uh, redox potentials in the terms of the cyclic voltammetry. Then we looked at, we try to compare these redox potentials uh, going from a positive to the negative as a function of change in the uh, in this uh, uh, binding centers are changing because as you go from uh, nitrogen centers to the oxygen centers to the negatively charged oxygen centers the redox potential uh, changes from positive to less positive to negative okay so what does that mean what that means is that uh, the the reduction is less favored uh, the oxidation is more favored. When you have more positive potential, more reduction is favored in that. Now, if you compare these things with the enzymes, so the enzyme, the lacage and the ceruloplasmin, the azurin and the plastocyanin, they are all plus 0.4 around that. Okay? So, that kind of a potential is certainly coming within this range of this. So, therefore, one can, uh, um, one can explain that in these proteins, the protein centers are uh, having a lot of imidazole binding, nitrogen ligand binding, maybe even some sulfur ligands binding as well in all these uh, aspects. Now, you can see that, uh, that so we can use a variety of spectroscopy techniques. I will talk to you about the, uh, the NMR, then we have talked to you EPR, then I have talked to you redox potentials. A few more techniques I will talk in the next. Uh, class 
uh, then with that we will finish the techniques uh, part of it. Thank you very much.